Come on, how many of you are excited for a move of God today? Amen, amen. Hey, I want to read you something. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is in, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But instead he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. Watch this. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. And this is where it gets even better, believe it or not. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name, somebody say name, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is power when we call upon the name of Jesus. So we're gonna sing this new song today. It's called Jehovah. It's one of my wife's favorite songs. And I wanna sing this to you so we can kind of sing it with it when it comes, but the chorus goes a little bit like this. It says, call the name, call the name, call the name. Jehovah, all our praise, all our praise, all our praise belongs to Him. And then again, call the name, call the name, call the name, Jehovah, all our praise, all our praise, all our praise, all our praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we can go right in the top line. Hallelujah, God. Oh, we bless your name, Jesus. You're so good to us. You're so good to us. So good to us, God. Yes, yes. You are Jehovah, Jehovah. Yeah, we lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus. Oh, yeah, we are singing to you, Lord. So come on, call his name. So call the name. Call the name Jehovah 
celebrating with over 40 people across the morning that are getting water baptized. If you're not familiar with what water baptism is, that just means that the Lord has done a work in their hearts and they are making an outward expression of an inward change. And as they go under the water, they are being buried in their sin. And we learned last week that our God is a resurrecting God. And so as they come out of that water, they are being resurrected into new life. And we are excited about that. So as they come up out of the water, let's make a huge deal about it. Turn your attention over to the tank.
Come on, church, can we just give him a highest praise this morning? Lord, you are worthy of all of our praise. God, we give you the highest praise today. We celebrate you, Jesus. We are here for you. We are here for you, God, to give you glory, to give you honor, and give you praise. Come on, can we shout for praise for 20 baptisms happening this morning? I know we have like another 20-some baptism scheduled for our next service. What a great way to spend a week after Easter, amen? Hey, before you're seated, turn around, get somebody a high five, tell them you look better today than I thought you would. We are so glad you're here. Hey, if you're watching online, we're glad you tuned in. You're amazing. We wish you were here in, per in person, but we're so glad that you're watching and we know that you're going to be blessed today as you tune in. Make sure you like it, make a comment in the chat box, share the video with a friend, and we can't wait to see you in person in one of our campuses. Thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, y'all look good. We have a good start to the morning, and we have other great stuff happening today. Uh, we have our growth track class happening at 1030. If you have not yet discovered your purpose and started making a difference in the kingdom of God, I want to encourage you at 1030, go to our growth track class and get plugged in. You're going to learn about who we are at Faith Church. You're going to learn about yourself, and you're going to learn about what you can do to start making a difference. Amen. Hey, we have some amazing guests here today. Can we put our hands together for those who are new this morning? Listen, if you're new, we're so glad you're here. We have a gift for you. And if so, when you leave today, we want to encourage you to stop by our Connect Center. We have an amazing team that wants to just get to know you better. And we're going to give you a wonderful gift. But more than anything, we want to help you on your journey to discover your purpose and make a difference. And so if you're new, stop by on the way out. We cannot wait to connect with you. And if you've been here a while, but you feel like maybe you need to, to shore up your foundation in, in your faith and, and you want to just get some even deeper roots with what you believe and why you believe what you believe, we want to encourage you to attend our In Christ class. That is also happening at 1030 a.m. If you just want to dive deeper into, into knowing who God is and, and who he can be to you, uh, we want to encourage you to attend that in, in Christ class. You're going to be blessed by that. Amen? Hey, we are so thankful that we get the opportunity. Look at your neighbor say opportunity. We have the opportunity to give today. And here's the thing I love with when we, when we give our tithes and offerings. When we give our tithes, we're not giving God what's ours. We're just returning to him what's already his. And so we have the opportunity to worship in our giving today. Amen? As the ushers come forward, Father, we thank you for that opportunity to give. Lord, we don't give reluctantly. We don't, we don't give under coercion. Father, we give because you first gave to us. You gave your son to us. And so us giving back to you, Father, that's, that's just an act of worship, an act of celebration. So we give to you freely and joyfully today. In your name I pray, amen. We are believing God for some amazing open doors in 2024. Faith Church, our mission since 1978 has been to foster a deep connection with the teachings of Jesus. Whether you've been a member of our congregation for years or you are stepping into our community for the first time, we're honored to embark on this journey towards spiritual growth together. My name is Lexi Fountain and let's not waste another moment. Take out your phones because we have a few things coming up that you don't want to miss. Join us for the highlight of the season, our annual Faith Missions Men's Golf Tournament. Tee off is on Friday, April 26th at 8 a.m. sharp at the Berkeley Country Club. Registration and check-in kickoffs at 7 a.m. So besides enjoying a fantastic round of golf, know that every swing supports our missions. Secure your spot today at faithishere.org slash events. At this time, take a swing on what's going to happen April 26th.
oiled precision, tightly honed skill, knowledge of the competition, and extreme focus. This is what you need to compete in championship golf tournament, but not in ours. So bring your game and enjoy. All the ladies in the house, can I hear you say abide? Abide is just around the corner on April 19th and 20th, happening here at Faith Church Somerville campus. This conference is designed with you in mind to uplift, empower, and grow your journey with Jesus. There's something incredible that happens when we abide in his presence. We will have the incredible best-selling author, dynamic speaker, and beloved radio host, Susie Larson, joining us, along with Sheila Harper, the passionate director of Save One Ministries. So join us for a time of powerful worship and the opportunity to connect with other women who are on the same journey as you. To get your tickets today, you can register at abideconferencesc.org. We can't wait to see you. Hey, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us today. And if you're new to Faith, scan the QR code down below. And to catch up on all of our series, download our Faith mobile app or go to our YouTube channel. Now let's get ready to receive from God's Word. Woo! Woo! I just want to know why some of you were singing that louder than you were during worship. That's messed up. I'm going to be lost. Hey, well, uh, I'm, I'm not speaking today, but I have the privilege to introduce somebody. Uh, this was a man who I, a 27-year-old young pup, realized I needed a lot of help. How many of you realized when you were in your 20s, you just needed some help? And so I grabbed one of the smartest people I could, and I took him out to breakfast and said, hey, would you mind being a mentor for me? And he quickly looked at me and said, no way. No way. I'm kidding. He, he did, and for the last 18 years, this man has been mentoring me. He is the former district superintendent for the Potomac District of the Assemblies of God. He's been an executive pres presbyter. He is a podcaster. He is a transformational leader. He is an author, and uh, he's been speaking wisdom into my life for the last 18 years, and it's funny. We went out to dinner last night, and I forgot because we used to go out, out to breakfast a lot, and, and, and last night, we went out to dinner together, and uh, I forgot I always had to have my phone available because as soon as he starts talking, I have to say, hold on one second, let me get out my notes app, and let me just start writing that stuff down. And so he's been uh, a mentor for me and, and has had a major impact on my life. So can you give a faith church welcome to Dr. Roden? <laughs> love you. Thank you. Love you too. Hey, thanks, Pastor Tim. It's great to be here with the faith community. Well, I, uh, I got to be in on your service last Sunday by, uh, by YouTube. Wasn't that an awesome message by Pastor Jason? Wow. Wow. Uh, and when he starts off talking about hope, well, that was his first point, the resurrection brings us hope. I said, you've got me, I'm all in. I'm all in because hope is the theme of my life. Matter of fact, I, when I was pastoring for 22 years in Richmond, I preach so much about hope, they call me Bob Hope at times. <laughs> I, I love the word hope. And then uh, to talk about relationships and then to end with purpose. What a great message. Then he gets to baptize people this morning. This is uh, so, so awesome to be here with you and to be in this faith community and to share the word of the Lord. And I want to say thanks to Pastor Tim for uh, making all the arrangements and uh, taking a chance on me, taking a chance on me this morning to, uh, to entrust me for these few minutes with, with all of you. And we haven't met, but, uh, so uh, I'm just looking forward to making new friends today. And this is, uh, as we think about the Easter postlude, the things that happened after Easter, Pastor Jason set it up beautifully last week by, by talking about what happened in the afternoon of Easter where Jesus takes that walk to Emmaus with those two people. 
and uh, it turns out to be a transformational time in their lives. And then uh, if, you, if you follow that, there are what we call the final 40, the final 40 days that Jesus was on this earth. He, he was on this earth as a resurrected Jesus, 40 days. So I want to pick up and just say, after that afternoon session on the road to Emmaus, and then uh, the disciples are afraid and they gather in a room and Jesus comes to them. As a matter of fact, the scripture says it was on the evening of that first day. So chronologically, we are right in place. On the evening of that first day, John chapter 20, if you want to uh, turn in your Bibles or just turn in your iPads or whatever you use, John chapter 20, where Jesus comes to them. It's an amazing passage that we, uh, we think about together. So it was on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. You're talking about people that were, they're just afraid for their life. They're not sure what's gonna happen. They're in deep disappointment. Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. What calming words. What calming words. You couldn't have said anything better to people who are afraid. If you're afraid today for some reason, I wanna just say to you, hey, peace be to you. I'm certainly not anywhere near what Jesus is like, but I could use his words. Peace be to you today. If you have fear or trouble or you're struggling, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And then again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Our text, our topic this morning comes right out of Scripture. I am sending you. You know what it's like to send someone to be your representative or to go do something for you. Jesus takes people that are afraid. He takes people that aren't really sure about the future. He said, hey, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you just as my Father sent me. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Lord, help me in the next few moments to unpack how you spoke with the disciples and what that meant for them and what it means for us today. Thank you that the Bible is relevant. While it was not written to us, it was written for us. And we can learn some things from the experience the disciples had with you. So we open up our learning heart to you today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said with me, amen. amen. What I want to suggest this morning that when Jesus comes to this group of people, He's really starting the, the whole movement of the church. Now, we know that the day of Pentecost is the birthday of the church. But Jesus says, I'm going, to, I'm going to count on you guys, you disciples. I'm going to send you out just as I was sent. Well, they, uh, that had to strike a little bit of note of encouragement in them, and yet some bit of confusion. You're going to send us? And then he breathes on them. Now, the word for breath here is the word pneuma, from which we get the word spirit. Just hang with me for a moment while I do a little, little technical piece for us to put in context. I, I'm of the opinion that this is where the disciples were really transformed, and they became what we would call Christians today. They were transformed. Now, I know Christian, the people were called Christians first at Antioch. 
but this was their experience. You say, well, had they been following Jesus for three years? Well, obviously they had, but they had not been transformed. They couldn't be transformed until after the resurrection. So Jesus breathes on them. And the reason I think this is where new life came into them is because it's the same word here that's used in the book of Genesis in this way. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. New Testament's written in Greek. There was a time when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, and that's called Septuagint. I know all that's technical stuff. But when they translated the Hebrew into the to Greek, the passage in Genesis where God breathed into human beings, Adam and Eve, life, when he breathed life into Adam, the word breath there, the Hebrew word, of course, is ruach. But when they translate it into Greek, it becomes pneuma. So that just as God breathed life into people in creation, he Jesus now breathes life into these disciples. What an amazing experience. And then he says to them, I'm, I'm going to send you. And obviously the question is, where are you going to send us? How is it going to work? Well, in typical Jesus fashion, we get illustrations of how it works. Because if we look at a later passage in uh, chapter 20, it says that Thomas, called Didymus, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas was a doubter, and he gets a bad rap. I think we sort of throw Thomas under the bus sometime. But you know what I like about Thomas? He did not say he believed when he really didn't. There are some people who say they believe when they really don't. Thomas was a, a doubting person, and a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Isn't it interesting that he somehow came through the wall? He came through the door. I, I don't know a lot about scientific stuff, but I, somehow the molecular consistency of his body had to change when he was resurrected. Now he could literally just pass through things, and he shows up among them. And he says to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas gives us the highest words of belief that you'll find in the New Testament. He says, my Lord and my God. Thomas believed. I want to suggest that the church... People like us are sent to the doubters. We're sent to people who don't believe. We're sent to people who are confused. And Jesus sends this message. When you go, I'm with you. I breathe upon you. And he says, you're going to meet people who doubt. You know, it would be, uh, would it be kind of neat if, here at Faith Church, you just put a big sign outside, doubters welcome. Doubters welcome. And I want to say to any of you in the room this morning, you struggle with doubts, and, and it would be almost unbelievable that there are at least one or two people and maybe more like 10 or 12 or perhaps even 15 or 20 in a crowd this size. Say, you know what, I've, I've had some doubts who have struggled with some things. J Jesus is sending the church to you. He's sending the message of hope and life. 
He's sending the resurrection message to you today. And then he says to Thomas, Thomas, you believed because you've seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet they will believe. That's people like us. We haven't seen the Lord, but we've come to a place of faith. We've come to a place of belief. And if you're here this morning and you're struggling with doubts, you're in a great place. You know what? Part of Thomas's problem and part of what doubters do is doubters have a tendency to isolate themselves. That's what Thomas did. He isolated himself. And he just wanted to sort of be alone. But notice the steps back. He's with the disciples the next time they meet. So he decides, you know, I'm, I'm going to hang out with you guys a bit. So he hangs out with them, and then Jesus shows up. You know, if you come and hang out at the church, Jesus shows up. And he shows up in people like you. As Pastor Jason said last week, the stories that are here in this room of people who've come to faith and some of you are doubters. And you'll have a, an understanding heart and a kind word and a gentle spirit toward those who may be struggling with doubt. If you're here this morning and you said, hey, I'm, I'm gonna just kind of find my way back in. I'm not quite there yet, but I just wanna go hang out with the people at the church. You're in a good place. Because we'd like to say to you this morning, Hey, you're at a place where you can, you can share your doubts, you can share your issues, and we believe that Jesus can absorb those and handle them and make a difference in your life, and that ultimately you will come to a place of saying, my Lord and my God, I do believe. I do believe. I, I almost want to, I'm not going to do it because it's too risky. I almost want to say, all of you who've been strong doubters, stand up, but we're not going to do that but you know who you are. You know the people that have, you know the, who you are. You have the mind that sort of questions everything. You're in welcome. Welcome to be among us. Jesus said he would send the church to doubters, the people who had struggles in believing. And then chapter 21, Peter is up in Galilee after Jesus had appeared to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias or Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. And Peter says, hey guys, I'm, I'm going out fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. Whatever you do, you generally take people with you, whether it's good or bad. You generally take people with you if you're a person of any kind of influence. And six people said, hey, Peter, we're going with you. And they go out fishing. They fish all night and don't catch anything. I think Jesus is illustrating here to us that he sends us to people who get distracted there are so many things to distract us in life. And it's interesting that Peter, when he's distracted, goes back to doing what he was accustomed to doing. He goes fishing. Remember, he had given up the nets to follow Jesus. And now he says, I'm going back to do that again. It's interesting what we do when we get distracted. Distraction has a way of leading us to unwise decisions, and they fish all night, don't catch anything, and then Jesus, Jesus comes on the scene. Let me get some water here. Jesus comes on the scene and says, hey, guys, you caught anything? They said, no. Nah. He said, throw it on the right side of the boat, and then they haul in this big net of fish. 
Scripture says 153 fish. That's a lot. Put in the net. And then Peter, in response to John, saying, hey, that, that's Jesus on the shore. And Peter gets out of the boat and jumps into water, and it's 100 yards out, so apparently he's still deep enough where he can walk, and he comes to Jesus, and they all join Jesus on the beach. For Jesus has built a fire, and he's getting ready to serve them breakfast. How would you like to have breakfast on the beach with Jesus? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Breakfast on the beach with Jesus. And what's interesting is that Jesus is creating a scene here where he can say to them, you know, you take what you've just caught that I, that I really helped you with, and you mix it with what I've been doing here, and together we can have breakfast. I just sort of like to believe that what Jesus wants to do with all of our lives, if you've been distracted particularly, maybe at one time you were very active and serving God, and you did, maybe you were in the worship team, or maybe you taught a class, or maybe you served on some other team here. I'm not sure what you would have done, but you got distracted, and you've been fishing. And what Jesus is saying to you this morning is, hey, Take what you have, what I'll help you catch, mix it with what I have, and we can feed the world. We, we can do something. We can make a difference. Jesus wants to take people who've been distracted, bring them on the beach, serve breakfast to them, and then say, welcome back. Welcome back from your distraction." And I want to say that this morning in, in this church, if you're here today, or maybe you're listening online, I want to say welcome back from your distraction. Take what you have, mix it with what Jesus puts in your life, and watch what you can do. He said, I am sending you to people who doubt. I'm sending you to people who are distracted. And then he winds up his illustrations to us by turning to the apostle Peter. He says to Peter, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Jesus sends us to people who need a second chance. It was by a fire where Peter said, I, I don't know who Jesus is. And now by a fire, Jesus is going to give him a second chance. I've been to Israel five times, and on two of the occasions I was there, we went to a place on the Sea of Galilee that you may have been near at least this spot. Nobody knows exactly where these places are. but And I stood on that, on that little beach there and taught from this passage. It was, a, it was an amazing experience where Jesus wants to give the, the Apostle Peter a, a second chance. Now, second chances are, are, are needed for a number of reasons, but let me just cite two quick reasons. Number one, if you've messed up. If you've messed up and you need a second chance, that's who the church is sent to. Are you here this morning and maybe you just need a second chance because you messed up? Or a third chance or a fourth or fifth? Jesus sends us to people who need a second chance. Can I just uh, tell you quickly about one second chance I got when I messed up? I was a senior in high school, and uh, we had an English literature class. It was the last class of the day, that uh, 2.30 or so in the afternoon, the time when you're sleepy. I didn't like this class, and uh, Miss Blackburn was my teacher. Room 106 of Robert E. Lee High School in Jacksonville, Florida. It's now called Riverside High School. 
And so while we were doing some things, they had a dictionary there that I needed to use, and I, I was using it, and I didn't get finished, and I thought, I'll just take this home with me. So I stuck it in my books, and I took it home with me. The next day, Miss Blackburn was asking every class about what happened to the dictionary. Came to our class time, and she was asking about the class, and I, I mean, I just very enthusiastically tried to help her find it. That's what you do when you're guilty. I was so ridden with guilt. I mean, I was looking all over. Oh, we'll, we'll find that dictionary, Miss Blackburn. But I had it at home. I had stolen the dictionary. I guess I could have taken it back, but I, one day led to another and another, and finally I said, I, I just keep it. Mine. Borrowed material becomes my material. <laughs> so it was, uh, that's in the spring of 1958. In the fall of 1958, I commit my life to Jesus and feel a call to the ministry. So I went to a school not too far from here, another state over it, that's called Tacoa Falls College. And I'm entering Bible college to go study for ministry with my stolen dictionary. It had stamped right in the middle of the property of Robert E. Lee High School. I had kind of made an X through it to sort of help me, but I had this dictionary. A speaker came through and talked about making things right. If you've done anything wrong, you ought to make things right. And I mean, I got really convicted. And I thought, you know, I have to take this dictionary back. It's been, uh, I mean, now it's been almost a year that I've had it. So I had some break, I don't know, it was either Christmas or spring break or sometime, I made a trip back to Jacksonville. And I walked into Robert E. Lee High School to room 106. There was Miss Blackburn. She said, well, hi, Bob, how are you? Are you graduated? I said, yes, I know. And I said, I'm here because, remember that dictionary that was missing in your class last year? She said, yeah, I think so. And I said, I stole it. And I'm here to bring it back to you. And I told her that I had given my life to Christ and I was studying for ministry and she reached over to grab me a great big hug and she said, you'll make a good minister, Bob, doing stuff like this. Now, you, you don't have opportunities to return everything and make everything right that you've ever done wrong. I understand that. But sometimes you're given an opportunity for a second chance. The second way that you get opportunity for second chances is when you have circumstances in your life that you didn't create. You may not know unless I told you that my parents were both killed when I was two years old. And I grew up with a grandmother. Actually, it was my stepfather who died or got killed. And so I used to ask my grandmother, explain stepdaddy to me. And she'd say, well, your mom divorced your father and married another man, and, and your mom and your stepdad were killed. I said, will I ever see my dad? She said, oh, maybe so. He went away to World War II. So I grew up with that, and uh, when I was 15 years old, my grandmother died. It was a pretty sad day. Sad day for me because she was the one that really loved me and cared for me, and I didn't have any brothers and sisters, and I, we lived in a little small place in North Florida, but it was a lot of love, and my grandmother was a wonderful Christian lady. So when uh, she died, and I, I really went on with life, and it was after she died that I gave my life to Christ. Then I met a wonderful lady after I had graduated from Bible school. Her name was Joan, and Joan and I were married, and 1966, and I told her about what I've told you about my life. I didn't know a lot about my family and so forth, and uh, Joan has a keen mind, and she has lots of curiosity. And she said, Bob, there's, it's just strange. Your, your, your dad died, and you got killed in an accident. You've never seen your stepfather, and uh, I said, well, I, you know, I did see him one time. She said, really? I said, yeah, when I was 
when my grandmother was at the hospital, a man came and my uncle came and introduced me to my, the man that was my, my, my dad. And uh, she said, really? She said, well, where is he? And I said, I don't know. I've never, never heard from him. I was, I was 15 at the time. I've never heard from him. Don't know anything about him. She said, there just got to be more to that story. So we took off to Florida and went to see an aunt. And Joan said to my aunt, is there more to the story? I mean, Bob's stepdad dies. He meets a man when he was 15 that's his dad and never heard from him. And she said, there's more to the story. The man he met when he's 15 is not really his biological father. Oh, the plot thickens. So a stepdad is dead, and a man who has my, allegedly my dad, doesn't, doesn't, uh, is not my dad. I said, well, who is my dad? I said, a man named Drew Strickland is your dad. He got your mom pregnant when she was 14 years old. And they never got married, but she married another man, the man you met when you were 15, and he gave you a name. So your, your real dad is another man. I said, this story is really confusing. But they, I said, well, where is, where is my real dad? He said, your real dad died when he was 30. Well, that at least set some pieces for me, and I went on with life, and we went on ministry, and the Lord gave us three wonderful children, and I was 52 years old, and I got word that my the man that I met when I was 15 died. I said, wow, this is a, this, this, this is, I just set something off inside of me. I said, I, you know, I, I, I've got to find a picture or something of my real dad. I got a picture of the stepdad. I got a picture of that man I met when I was 15, but I don't have a picture of my biological father. So we took off to Florida and met the only living brother of my dad. His name was Uncle Covey. Uncle Covey was, he was quite a character. A lot of fun. Drove a pickup truck, wore a hat, had a straw hanging out of his mouth. Had that southern drawl talk, the guy that everybody loved. And he said, Bob, I'm, I, I knew your dad. Obviously, he's my brother. And I said, well, I just came to get a picture of my dad. He said, I'll give you a picture, but I'll give you some other news. Do you know you have three sisters you've never met? I said, nah. He said, you've got three sisters, and, and I'd love for you to meet them. Well, to fast forward, in 1995, I met three sisters that I never knew I had. Sharon, Aline, and Hester. And it's been awesome over these last almost 30 years now to, to develop this level of relationship. And why did I tell you that story? I told you because I want you to know that whatever your past is, whatever your circumstances are today, it doesn't have to trap you. It can shape you. It can make a difference in your life. It can make a difference. You, you don't have to be trapped. And Jesus sends us to doubters, to people who are distracted, and people like you and me who need a second chance. He's given me a second chance in so many ways. And you know what's really neat this morning? While I'm preaching, my wife, you're going to see a picture of her on the screen in just a moment. Can you put up a picture of my wife? There she is. We've been married 58 years. My wife, hey, yeah, give her a hand. There's that's Joan. And two of my sisters, put the picture of my sisters up, would you? There are my sisters. That's a few years ago. The two in the middle, Aline and Sharon, are at our house in Richmond and they're watching online this morning. They're watching online this morning. <laughs> hey, Joan, I love you. Thanks for watching. And Sharon and Alina, love you as my sisters. Thanks for watching today. And I'm grateful God gave us a second chance. I'm grateful God gave us a second chance. <laughs> So 
so it's time for me to wind up. I could, uh, I could talk a long time about this. But Jesus says, I want to send people like you, the doubters, people that are distracted, and people who need a second chance. That's what the church is about. Sending us, if you're here this morning and you've been struggling with doubt, I want to give you a chance in just a moment to say a prayer, a prayer of reconnection. If you've been distracted, hey, why don't you take what you have and bring it on back and say, I'll, I'll use what God has in my life and make a difference. Or if you're here and you need, you need a second chance, this is your morning. This is your day. That's what the church is about. Jesus said, I will send you to those kind of people and the world will change because, well, what a difference he makes. Would you pray with me, please? If you're here and you, uh, you're in any one of those three categories or maybe you don't fit one of those categories, but you're saying, I, I need to connect with, if, if Jesus is who you say he is and if he cares that much about me, I want to connect with him this morning. I want to either reconnect or I want to take my doubts and bring to him or I just need a second chance or I need for the first time to connect with Jesus. I'm going to have you say a prayer right where you're seated. But in order to, just before you do that, would you, uh, would you give just one little signal that you're doing that this morning? I can't see all the way up and around, but if you're, if you're praying a prayer for any one of those reasons, or including I just want to connect with Jesus for the first time, I'm going to say a little prayer right where I'm seated. Would you just lift your hand and make eye contact with me across the room? Yeah, oh, look at those hands. Well, yes, yes. Oh, so many people. Yeah, over there, I'm looking over to my right. Yeah, thank you for helping me. Now say a prayer like this, right where you're seated. Just say, put your hand over your heart. Say, Jesus, I, I come to you this morning with my doubts. I come with my distractions. I come needing a second chance. Or I'm coming for the first time. I believe that you were raised from the dead. I believe that you care about my life and you want to save me. So I put my life in your hands right now. I accept your forgiveness. I thank you that you're breathing on me just now, giving me new life. Thank you, Lord, for breathing all over this congregation on people today with new life. We give you thanks now for all that you're doing in people's lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Would you give the Lord a great big applause for what he's done today? Amen. Such a good word. Thank you, Doc. Dr. Roden uh, has a couple of books that he's written. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about his story that he shared a little bit of, he has a book called From Restless to Reconciled uh, out in our lobby. And then there's a leadership book that we are actually taking our staff through right now called The Four Faces of a Leader. Those are available uh, in the lobby. Uh, but could you stand with me for just a moment? And uh, I, I just want to seal, seal this moment with you because it, it's last week we had 35 people or so gave their lives to Jesus. And, and this week, as, as Dr. All over this place, that people that are recommitting their lives to Jesus. And so I don't want to lose out on this moment. We're going to have our altar team come forward and, and be around here at this front altar. But it, could you just close your eyes with me for just a moment? Because I, I, I believe that God is doing something special here at Faith, at this church. I, I believe that God is actually doing exactly what, what Dr. Roden spoke about. He's, he's sending you. He's sending me. He's sending us into, to, to those who are, who, who are doubting, to those who are distracted, to those who need a second chance. And, and, and so if you, would, if you just need some prayer, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I, I, you know, I, I believe in Jesus, but maybe I'm struggling with my doubt. I'm struggling with my fear. I'm struggling. Or 
Our, our, our marriage is struggling. My relationships are struggling. And, and we, just, we just need something. I, I, just, I want someone to agree with me in prayer. We're going to do a formal dismissal here. But I want to encourage you to, to get out of your seats. Come down to the altar. And we have a team here that, that just wants to connect with you. And, and also, if you slipped up your hand, you raise your hand and said, I, I want to commit my life to Jesus today. Uh, we we want to connect with you here at this altar as well. Because we want to help you take those next steps to becoming a follower of Jesus. Amen? So if you could, with your heads bowed, Father, we say thank you for this moment. This, this moment is yours. Father, we, we don't make room for you in these services. We, we give you the room. It's all yours. And so, Father, we commit our hearts to you. We commit our mission to you, our purpose to you. Father, as we leave this place today, we commit to being those who are sent. I pray that your spirit would go before each and every one of us as we exit out of these doors, that you would give us eyes to see those who you are sending us to, whether it be at a restaurant, whether it be a family member or co-worker. God, you, have, you are sending each and every one of us, and we accept that mission today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our altar is going to be rain, remain open. If you would like prayer, we encourage you to come down. God bless you, church. Have a great, great day in the Lord.
You ain't drive me in that pit. Hey, nah. Saw my soul inside that fam and said that's it. Grace now. Nah. You never flake in the car winner. I just came to ball with the gold winners. Fast forward, turn to a road runner. Spirit caught me here, go get it. Shed blood, gave me lemonade on this cold bin. Uh, yeah, pick me up. Always Timmy Turner, always chasing after Vicky on. Took me to his fine and gave me peace and chose to cleanse me up. Now I'm testifying, know your greatness, this a different love. Go on. Life been hitting hard, let's take it slow oh, oh. Take a walk by the river and let you flow oh, oh. Cause Lord, you are all I ever want You're all I ever want Cause I was lost until you found me Now I know you're all around me Nothing I could ever do
Don't gotta get what I want right now Cause you'll come through again, 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 and again Oh, but even if you take your time
patient You are kind So I thought I finally got it right this time You are lovely And full of life But honestly I felt it wasn't right I know my heart will feel the same again in time I don't wanna give up Chance it didn't really work out Doesn't mean that there's nobody to find now I don't wanna give, I don't wanna give up on love Up on love, up on love been waiting, been chasing, and every night I'm praying for things I only write about in songs. Someone to walk beside, is that so wrong? I don't wanna give, I don't wanna give up on love, up on love. I know I'm not alone, but when I'm alone, it's so rough, and did so much. Took a chance, it didn't really doesn't mean that there's nobody to find now I don't wanna give, I don't wanna give up on love Up on love, up on love For years I've been on my own Now I know that I'm not alone You're giving me a reason to carry on To carry on, yeah, yeah Yeah, everything is different nowadays I lost a few ones along the way I had to learn to trust it'll be okay It'll be okay Every moment I was sure I kind of love that I never known. You took over my heart and you made a home. Yeah, you made a home. And all the broken pieces within. You put them together again. And with you, a new story begins, begins. Hey, I don't know.
There is something burning keeping me alive. Yeah. Telling me to fight until the morning light. Yeah. It won't let me quit. It won't let me stop. Won't let me stop. Oh. It's rebuking the fear, rebuking the worry. Stop with me. Rebuking the lies and anxiety. I'm holding on to this one thing that helps me believe. You for 